Oh, I forgot to. Oh, here, I wrote to you in the paper, but not. I got too nervous. I must not be prepared. Yes, thank you, Gary, for this generous introduction, and thank you, Roberta, for being here in order to discuss art criticism with me. Uh, before I continue uh, to speak, I would like to apologize for my German accent, which I, I, I feel like I sound incredibly German in, in this environment, and I hope you'll get used to that, and maybe Can I just say mine? it will get better, yeah. And I'd like to thank Pamela and Gary for having me here. It's been amazing. We've been here about 31 hours and having a fantastic time. And also to thank you for holding this forum in the only language I really speak. I appreciate that <laughs> we can do that, even if the, it's not the general language here. So thank you for that. Great. So let's start. OK. Um, I wanted to suggest that we speak about um, the fact that there is no such thing as art criticism. Uh, there are actually different types of art criticism. And if we speak about art criticism, we might as well differentiate between these different types, like, you know, which kind of coexist next to each other, mm -hmm. such as uh, art criticism in daily newspapers, which is what you are doing, or um, the art criticism that happens in the kind of feuilleton, as, as, as we call it in, in mm -hmm. Germany. Then we have academic art criticism. We have art criticism in art magazines and art criticism in lifestyle magazines. And all these art criticism are pretty different. Um, so since you produce art criticism for the New York Times, and I mostly write for academic journals, such as Texte zur Kunst or Art Forum, uh, we have, of course, different practices. and you know, occupy different positions in the field of art criticism. And I thought we might as well mention that right in the beginning. And maybe you could try to describe the specificity of the type of art criticism that you represent. What is specific about writing reviews every week for the New York Times? And what does, in what way does this activity differ from other types of criticism? I mean, for me, it's, it's, and it's obvious, I guess, that you're working under a different deadline pressure than I do, and that right. you speak to a much larger audience. But how is your writing affected well, by these parameters? I mean, you know, I'm, I consider myself a working critic. Mm -hmm. I'm not philosophical. I'm not theoretical. And in some ways, I think that I'm really doing the right criticism, really the only <laughs> criticism. <laughs> <laughs> because as, as Mencken said, it's written in heat and, and published at once. And it's a kind of, it has a kind of, the speed of it uh, gives it a specialness and uh, gives it its flaws, which can be forgiven because of the speed of it. And you're, uh, I'm a journalist who has opinions, and I'm paid to have my opinions. And it's fabulous fun. Um, I didn't become a critic until I, or feel I was truly a critic until I wrote for The Voice. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's now no longer something special, but the experience of being in print when the art I was writing about was on view was completely exhilarating. And that was, the, that was when I really got my confirmation that, that this was the thing to do because it, it took out everything. I couldn't, I couldn't think about anything except kind of being, being honest. You're, you're left with so little between you and the art and the deadline that uh, you just work, you, you're forced to work with what you have. And I think, um, I don't know. So you, de you develop your voice. It, it has mm -hmm. to be personal. It has to be close to how you talk because you have to get it done quickly. And you basically are talking to people. It's really constantly talking and then Every week I get to have this conversation, and then next week I'm still talking, you know? And it's, it's just, uh, it's, so I think of it, you know, I don't have footnotes, obviously, and it's, it's, it has to be, I guess, kind of entertaining in a certain way. I, I want to think of it as you write something that has a kind of pace and a kind of tone, and people will just read it through. My readers don't have much time. And uh, I want them to feel like it's 
use, they, they've used it. I mean, the thing I talk about a lot is I'm interested in use value. I want it to be really useful in some ways. And it's useful, I want to get people out looking at art. That's the main thing I want to do. Get people out of the house. Is to get them write something that away from their computers. Away from their computers. <laughs> Say something, illustrate a process of looking and of arriving at a judgment that will make people want to go and see for themselves. And knowing that, that then I'm in a position where and this was the thing about being in print when the art's on view, is that the idea that people can really look at what you've written about and really assess the usefulness of what you've done. That was, that was you know, I think that a lot of development, you know, I'm sure in every field, in some way has to do with just terror. You know, like, you, like things, you're scared and you work harder or you do better. But that idea, that was what kind of emptied it out made the white noise go, go away, like, oh yeah, they're going to just, I better, you know, make this as good as I can, because they're going to go and they're going to look at that Gustin, or they're going to look at that Richter, or whatever. But you know, when, when you talk about wanting people to get out of the house, and mm -hmm. wanting people to see these shows, I'm reminded of, of what art criticism traditionally was supposed to do. When you think of someone like Denis Diderot, you know, who wrote for this fanzine, we would say, right. we would call it today. Uh, and what he actually did was he, he was going through the salons and um, described what he saw and gave recommendations uh, to the kind of members of the European court elite, right. which were subscribed to this fanzine. Uh, so aside from the fact that Diderot was actually also working as an agent from a today's point of view, because he kind of recommended people also what to buy, um, things have changed since, because um, I would say at least since the historical avant-garde, at least since Duchamp, um, artists do write about their work, and they tend to consider their own statements as an integral part of their work. Think of Duchamp's Green Box, which contains his statements and is his artwork. So what happens to criticism in a moment where artists become discursive subjects and insist on their own statements about their work to be their work. Do critics, are kind of critics released from this function to mediate this work? Which is in a way I think what happened maybe in the 1960s 60s with the foundation of October magazine. October magazine for me is a magazine that stands for criticism transforming itself into cultural critique. Since critics don't need to mediate the works of art anymore, because artists tend to do that themselves, they produce cultural critique, social critique, and you know, uh, and, and 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 don't mainly describe what the artist wants to do anymore. Well, I don't so think in, in such a if, if I, mean, I mean this is a kind of the, the way I would describe this history. What does this mean for for the critic? Well, or how do you deal with these artist statements? There are a lot of them, you know. Well, I don't think artists own the meaning of their work, mm -hmm. and if they did, it would be. We would, it would be extremely limited mm -hmm. that artists make work and they have various ideas about them and they're trying to put those ideas sort of out and in something that will sur hopefully survive without them. And they can accompany it by a certain amount of, of talking and writing and, and language. You know, we can name all kinds of artists, but that's still they're not mediating in the same way. They're sort of trying to control things, mm -hmm. and they're trying to sort of help you, but also prescribe what it is you're supposed to see. And I think I think there's you know what you have what critics have is a kind of neutrality, and you have a kind of disinterest in your own response. I have much less at stake than say Judd had in talking about his work. You don't. That's what that's the whole definition of it. And I also think that. You know, when I first wrote in the art world, I really thought that I was a, the advocate for the artist, and that I, the artist was the person that I wanted to please. And again, I'm going to come back to this thing of being in print with the art because once I got to the voice, I I, I realized I was on the I was on the front row of the audience, mm -hmm. that I wasn't going to presume presume to tell the artist anything about his or her work, but I was going to be able to give the artist. I was going to, like I said, demonstrate the act of, of looking for the viewer 
And if the artist was interested, I was giving them information about how their work was received. Like before, I always see myself as part of the broadcast. Mm -hmm. And then at, starting with The Voice, I sort of was, was, you know, I could tell them, this is what you seem to be broadcasting. This is what we're getting out here. And artists could say, that's crap. I'll never read this again. Or they could say, that's interesting. That's not what I meant. Mm -hmm. You know, how can I, what can I do that can get where I get a response that's more in line with my thinking. I, I don't think many artists think that way. I think they're going to do what they're going to do, but that's fine. Well, I think the best artists hope for controversy. And uh, maybe, um, I mean, I would completely agree with you. We as critics have to take the statements of artists with a grain of salt. Totally. We should never take them literally, and especially we shouldn't believe them. Mm -hmm. We shouldn't think or assume that what the artist says is the truth about his work. On the other hand, these statements of the artist can't be ignored either, because they are part of the work. So I think these statements need as much to be interpreted as everything else. And um, you know, while I would agree with you that it is uh, not interesting to become a kind of pr promotional voice for the artist, I think that the fact that artists have turned into discursive subject at least since Duchamp, and even more so since conceptual art, is an accomplishment that challenges criticism. It's, 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 for criticism, it, it means that you know, we can't completely ignore these statements, we can't, take, we can't believe them either, but we have to take them into account, and our work changes from mediators, maybe, to interpreters and commentators. Well, I don't think I agree, mm -hmm. but I, because I just think there's so, like, as you said when we began, there are many different kinds of criticism, mm -hmm. and I, I'm not a great reader, and I, I, I don't read artist statements that much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't pay that much attention to them. I'm, but if the I, work consists of statements, well, then you have to so read, so read. You have to read the sentences on conceptual art. It's a, it's a work of art, but it's text. Yeah, but actually, probably I can't remember what those what the sentences are. I mean, how artists it, are mystics, you know. I mean, it's great, you know. I think, oh my God, why didn't I read this before? This is showing me so much. But uh, it doesn't, you know. Okay, sometimes I'm a reader. It, I'm a reader. I sometimes it. it happens, but there's a whole other level, you know. There's a whole lot of other people out there who don't really have access. Mm -hmm. And I admire artists, writers who work in what the the artist's point of view. But I'd, I'd sort of like to come at it from a different point of, you know, I'd like to come back to it through the art mm -hmm. and, and, um, and bring the reader with me in a certain way. But I just think that's, yeah, it's really interesting. Artists have always, I mean, definitely in the 20th century, have been very articulate about their work and, and brilliant about art. But I'm sort of, you know, I'm sort of down here on a lower level mm -hmm. in a way. And, um, but it's, it's one more thing that if you want to, of course you can mediate it, and of course you can help your reader get to that as well as to the art. Yeah. I wanted to address another topic since we are in Germany. Um, there is a tendency among, amongst German journalists and also in the art world in general to declare criticism to be in a crisis. Actually, criticism is the kind of dead horse that is always beaten and made responsible for everything that goes wrong. Uh, also, one of the reasons for its current weakness is assumed uh, to be the fact that it is other agents of the markets, of the art market, such as collectors, um, curators, or auction houses, who supposedly are more powerful and influential when it comes to making value judgment on art. And I always think, you know, yes, it is certainly true that a collector who would say want to buy a Jeff Koons uh, in an auction would hardly consider an art critical text beforehand in order to find out whether he's going to do this or not. He, you well, know, I, I mean, I, given, what, given what auction houses are publishing in their catalogs now, there's a lot of reading you can do. Right, but it's not art criticism. No. It's not it's, art, it's promotional texts. Okay, he can, I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> yes. <laughs> we'll, come, we'll come to that, okay, we'll come to that. So I think, say, if an art historian like myself would write a well-founded argument questioning the late work of Jeff Koons, 
this wouldn't stop any collector to buy his work, I think. I think on that I level... I can generalize. I'm sure there would be some people who would back yeah, off. Yeah, but I think oh, yeah. on, the level, on, the level, on the level of the auction sphere, in the auction sphere, criticisms and, criticism and art history do not matter. It's, for me, the auction sphere is a kind of intellectual free zone. Nevertheless... <laughs> I thought everybody would agree, but anyway, so... <laughs> <laughs> but nevertheless, I think that criticism does matter a lot, since it is still... Um, criticism is where symbolic value is produced. It is criticism that produces symbolic value. It's a term by Bourdieu, meaning mm -hmm. basically symbolic worth. Uh, and this is produced by criticism, and symbolic value is needed as a foundation for market value. There is no market value, at least in the long run, without symbolic value. And a nice example is, for instance, um, uh, Gagosian, who asked, the, the, the big gallery Gagosian, who asked uh, the, the renowned art historian Norman Bryson to write a text about John Curran. John Curran being an artist uh, very much acclaimed by the art market, but no art historian I respect has ever written positively about his work. So Gagosian felt forced to get an art historian to write about the work of this artist. So this shows you how art criticism does matter finally in order to produce this, totally. this symbolic value. And um, also, you know, if we, I, th I think on, in a way one could argue while art criticism has no power in the auction sphere, it, is, it has more power than ever in the rest of the art world. If, for instance, we consider only the amount of catalog texts that are commissioned, I think that... But um, do we consider that art criticism either? It's, uh, sometimes it depends. You know, it depends a little bit on the commissional situation, but I think that... Um, I, mean, I mean, I have been asked, for instance, to write texts for catalog that are critical. Critical Criticality yeah. is a kind of currency as well. All right. So, yes. So, so, um, so is it powerful or weak? That's well, I think that this is just a kind of chronic knee-jerk reaction. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you think about, you know, criticism is always in a crisis. There's a, there's a certain kind of longing for authority figures that we don't have. You know, there's this, there's this time, at least in America, there's this kind of idealization about Greenberg, you know, mm -hmm. and, and also he's either, and he's also a villain. He's kind you know, he has so much power. But I think that what Greenberg was doing was a kind of illusion. He cleaned up things, and he, he gave us this linear idea that was very easy to go along with, and, and it's, it's never that neat. And that kind of writing for me often is, is a del deliberate power play, and his yeah. effect is so complicated because he's advising artists. He's telling them, you know, cut it here, you know, <laughs> cut that off. Um, Changing he's artworks posthumously. Yeah, he's advising yeah. dealers. I mean, yeah. he's doing... He's advising collectors. He's operating in a very complicated way. Two things. I think that um, everybody's operating critically. I'm not interested in se setting off criticism as this kind of pure activity. Mm -hmm. I think that if you, when you buy art, when you auction, I think, that, I think of the art world as a place in which everybody has a vote. And everybody is voting early and often and again and again. You're voting when you write, you're voting when you go to a gallery, you're voting when you recommend that somebody go to a gallery. You're voting when you are influenced by a certain kind of, of work. That, and, and in writing, obviously. So that there are many different ways that, that, aside from criticism, but criticism as well, that this value is built and that a, 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 it accrues around works of art. And I think if it doesn't accrue around works of art, you're totally right. They don't really persist, but I don't think that the critics are the only people that are building the value. I think, say, artists, I, I mean, I really sort of think artists run the art world in a certain way, and that they, they, they anoint artists by being influenced by them. They recommend younger artists to dealers. They kind of, you know, they know they work in a lot of different ways. But I, I agree that everybody votes, but and I think that you know the, the process that leads toward value production is a kind of network process mm -hmm. uh, and is collective well, and consists yeah. of communication. I right. would agree with that. I, I would nevertheless maintain that that the voting a critic does or is a very specific one. And I was wondering if you would agree. Uh, that you know, if, if it is voting that critics do, then one could also say that critics produce 
symbolic value, produce value, and criticism itself has value, is a valuable activity. Um, since you know we don't only contribute to the value making process, mm -hmm. but criticism in itself is somehow considered a valuable activity. Do you agree with that? And would you acknowledge your own participation in value production in your own writing? Would you kind of hint to that in your own writing that you this is what you do? Well, you, we have different ways of saying things, so mm -hmm. I think that um, <laughs> that could be. <laughs> That's, that's why we're here, no, right? Exactly. <laughs> that's why I, I hope you would take this on. Um, uh, oh God. Everybody's always working, and their work is always being judged, if you're a dealer or a collector or an artist or a critic. And your work is being used or not used, mm -hmm. depending on its value. So you have a kind of value in it and if it has its own value, it will help people form ideas and, and decide what they're going to give value to. A lot of our criticism dies. There are lots, I always think of art objects or artworks as, as traveling through time and space, and all these people are like throwing ideas at them like spaghetti. <laughs> and some of them stick, and, and a lot of them don't stick. So that, um, but, but that's what gives them they come, you know, the longer they last and the longer, the more things that stick to them, the more, the more we value them and the more they, and I'm sort of saying it backwards, but, um, you know, I, I also think that, um, so I'm just saying that there's a, there, there's a lot of criticism like art that just fades mm -hmm. and that people, I don't know. So <laughs> you're, what you're saying is not every criticism has value and not every criticism is remembered as valuable. Yeah, yeah. And, and this is what we were talking about earlier. I don't think that, I mean, I think Greenberg is a really kind of interesting and completely crude, kind of brutal example of, of somebody really trying to have power and living in this great, you know, like you can, you can interpret Greenberg as in an idealistic way and in a kind of practical, pragmatic way or a psychological way. And I think that, um, I'm losing my train of thought, but I think that um, he really wanted a kind of power. And it was, you know, he had a tremendous ego, and, and I think that you, that you don't last very long if that's why you're going into criticism. And that basically power is something that people give to you. And it accrues from the usefulness of your work. And I always think that, that power is just totally in flux. You don't, you can't as a critic really take power for very long or do this as a strategic thing. But you are given power, you earn it. Yeah, and I think that Greenberg, despite the fact that, was, that he was this authoritarian macho guy, I think that his work is still very relevant today in order to understand what modernism actually was. You know, because he based his criteria in judge and judgments in what he assumed to be the laws of the medium. For him, you know, the medium, and he assumed a kind of essence of the medium, right. has its own laws, and according to these laws, art can be judged. Of course, in a situation like nowadays, where we live in a so-called post-medium condition, we cannot work with his vocabulary anymore. We cannot, cannot apply his criteria. But if we want to understand what modernism was and how art criticism functioned, we, we better look at Greenberg more totally. than Friedrich. Totally, uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and one of the reasons you want to look at, at least that I want to look at Greenberg is because he had this great phase as a working critic, yeah. looking at everything and writing about everything before he kind of started you know, deciding that we we're going to end up with uh, you know, Jules Olitsky. I mean, because what happens with that structure is that it really does run out of steam. And the idea of essence is just totally excluded so much. And, and you know, you, you could possibly make the same criticism of Judd, although I, think, I, I don't think it's quite the same. But that at a certain point in the 70s, one of the reasons you have conceptual art, I mean, this is, this is sort of what I think, but it was a kind of frustration. It's like saying, OK, let's start putting all this stuff back in. Mm. You know, let's have narrative. Let's let's, and that's, I mean, that's what the kind of 
big explosion of the of the seventies is to me this kind of reversal of that whole. But you know that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I just thought that maybe we have to also speak about criticism or art criticism to be more precise in relation to what is usually called the new economy or the new spirit of capitalism, which has been described by many scholars as an economy where communication functions as the queen of productive forces uh, and where our social contacts and friendships rise to the status of a currency. One example would be, of course, Facebook, where our friends are our capital. Um, and in such a situation, we are kind of, we are forced, you know, to accumulate contacts because this is the new currency, and uh, we face a kind of imperative to cooperate with others because we need these contacts so desperately. That means we cannot afford to pick a fight with a potential you know, cooperation partner. And if we agree with this description of the new economy, and, and maybe this is debatable, um, but uh, you know, sociologists like Botansky Schiapello have drawn such a picture of the current state of affairs. I think for an art critic, this means that it gets harder to write a very negative ass assessment of a particular practice, because this means that, you know, I mean, this is what I observe with my colleagues. There's an enormous fear of actually really raising doubt or declaring a practice to be not legitimate, because what this means is that the gallerists won't speak to you anymore. You might not get invited. It can mean, it can mean I mean, this is now very dramatic, social death. <laughs> it can mean, like, exclusion. And uh, you kind of are considered as someone who spoils the game. And it's really what I observe among my colleagues. They all only want to write about the things they love, uh, but they, they don't want to discuss a practice which they have problems with. And I think these fears, I mean, they're, not, they're never really mentioned, but it's the kind of latent atmosphere. But I think you always have those problems. Where, where cooperation, cooperation is really like the ordre de jour. Cooperation is what is expected of you. Sorry. But, I, but yes. I think that those problems always exist. You know, Haven't and, they intensified? And, Haven't they intensified? Well, it's complicated. I mean, you know, Peter Shelva would say you have to be in a place where, you, as a critic, you have to live someplace where you can lose a friend a day. And basically, you have to have a certain amount of density where you're sort of buffered. And you can kind of, I mean, I think that this is, you kind of just say, OK, this is what I think I'm going to write this, and it's going to go out. You know, and you just, you just do it. And then, then you, you know, you have you regret. Get you have regret. You feel sorry for the artist. You know you're hurting yeah. feelings. You, you can, uh, you can argue it another way. I mean, it's 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 a kind of really hard feeling. And then you have to. I mean, I just went through this last week, um, with a review I wrote of James Franco, where at the end you think, well, maybe I was too hard. You know, like. No, uh -huh. not with but, James Franco. But see, <laughs> but see, that's the thing about negative reviews. Is that there's no negative review as negative as what people will say on the phone. That's mm -hmm. what I used to say. Like, talk to Pat. if we could listen it on what artists are saying, on the, and this is in the past. But now we can actually listen in because because we have the internet. And, mm -hmm. and like you said when we were talking before, you have these extremes of just absolute hatred and denunciation, and then this other thing where people are sort of being nice. And um, there is this kind of caution, and like, oh, isn't this great? You know, it's just, it's kind of this celebratory thing, and I find it extremely naive. I think I'm really lucky. Yeah. I'm not that deep into social platforms, but I am on Twitter. And, but, but I still, I don't see that as my criticism. That's, that's the, that's why I sort of have one foot in an old world. So I can kind of pull, I hold back a certain, some stuff that's reviewed, reserved for my writing. And then, and, and yeah, you, and then Twitter is more like these other kinds of thoughts I would have that I could never figure out what to do with. Like, <laughs> just say like, oh, look at this. This is what I thought about, you know? I'm not gonna write a review, but go see it, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, I wrote a tweet where I got Robert Longo and, and Jean Etienne Leotard in the same tweet. You know, I think that's pretty amazing <laughs> that you can just you can just decide how you're gonna use it. But I'm I'm and I do, you know, of course I'm like counting my followers like crazy. 
but it's just not, but it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's I mean, I'm just speaking totally for myself, but I do think that people are just going to, you know, it's going to evolve. It has to evolve, where people sort of get bored with all the kind of celebration, or understand that there's something that they're going to, that they actually, you know, people will start saying, oh, well, there goes so-and-so, they've gone off again. You know, but we had that with Hilton Kramer. You, you, if you're really thinking about having a readership, you do this kind of math where you think, how negative can I be and not have people start feeling sorry for the artist? Do you know? And what, how do we deal with the fact that m for most critics, I think it, it really is true for most critics, uh, the object of their criticism is very often their friends. Uh, and um, there, there is an artist, Merlin Carpenter, who once said that this is maybe the most, the biggest challenge today is that we ought to criticize our friends. How, how do you deal with this? First of all, this concept of friendship has become much more elastic since Facebook. I mean, it doesn't really mean mu much and everybody's friends with everybody. How, how do you do it when you feel like you have to raise doubt about the practice of a friend? Do you, do you, ask someone else to do this, or, you know, how, how do you... <laughs> well, I'm in, a, I'm in a really particular situation. I mean, I feel that I, I never went to graduate school. I worked, I learned from artists, artists from my graduate school, starting with Judd, but also a lot of the artists. I worked for Paula Cooper for a while, and I was, and I, and I went to artist studios for years. So I feel incredibly grateful <clears throat> that, that they were a source of education, but at a certain point, I realized, you know, I stopped going to studios. Like, I wasn't that interested in having, being walked through the, the meaning or the effect or the experience of the work. Um, but you just, yeah, you know, we were talking about this earlier, you kind of, you kind of develop your own uh, standard, standards of behavior. I love artists, and I don't become friendly with that many of them. I have some artists that I'm really good friends with that I will not write about, and that's a loss. I would write about some of them negatively and some of them positively, but but I would know that no matter what I wrote, it would not be seen. It it would not have enough credibility, mm -hmm. you know. So I don't actually I write about people that I know, and some of them I've known for years, but in this kind of I keep them at a distance. Well, I think that, you know, the, the term criticism comes from the Greek kritikos, which means separating and distinguishing, mm -hmm. and which implies, of course, distance. Mm -hmm. And you were just hinting to that. Distance is the kind of central feature of criticism. But the question, of course, is how do we negotiate this difference in an economy uh, which, which kind of entangles us? We are kind of, by or if only by declaring something to be worth our consideration, we have created value. So we are implicated in this market, whether we want it or not, as critics. And in the same time, we have the right to object to it and to create a distance. So we have to negotiate this distance in a kind of situative manner. Every single occasion is an occasion where this distance is is negotiated. So in a way, one could say that criticism hovers between association and dissociation. We are associated mm -hmm. with the current conditions, but we have the power to dissociate ourselves from them as critics. That's the privilege of You don't of necessarily criticism. have the power, but you have the challenge. The challenge, but also the criticism, I think, traditionally has the right to insist on this distance, you know, even though it's a relative one, it's never an absolute distance. Yeah. So how do you negotiate this tension between association and dissociation in your own work? Well, at, at this point I sort of could feel like, well now I can sort of pretend I'm an artist. You know, that, that basically I don't know how I do that. Mm -hmm. But that... <laughs> de that you, <laughs> like de Kooning. Well, you, you just have to do it. You kind, of, you kind of write something and you think, well how does this sit, you know? How is this? I don't know. It's 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 complicated, but you can't totally be conscious of it, and yet you know when you've done something that doesn't quite sit with you, mm -hmm. like it. And but I also think that what you're talking about is just kind of a process. Like 
I mean, I just think being a critic is, and, and I don't mean to say that it's special because I think everybody's working this way, is that you're just, it, there's this kind of flux in you all the time and you're just, you know, like a work of art is just trying to nail something down for a minute. And then a review is trying to get something fixed, like all I really want to do is fill up a certain amount of, pay, of space. I really like, you know, on, on, a, on newsprint for a certain amount of time and I want it to be solid. You know, you just, I don't know, that's, you know. And how, how do you negotiate in your writing between the obligation to describe uh, and a kind of more universal claim that criticism also make, makes? As soon as I make a critical judgment, I go beyond what I see and what I personally think and make some sort of universal claim. So. So how do you, um, in your own work, how, how, how much do you describe? Because I've observed, uh, especially among young critics and art historians, that there is a tendency to describe for the sake of description. Yeah. There's a kind of return of a very positivistic criticism that satisfies itself with describing. And I always think if you describe something, you have to know why. What, what is your argument? Right. What is the argument that drives your description? Well, I, so how, how, do you have methodological rules like this uh, when, when you go about your own writing? Well, I think that criticism, the thing that makes criticism fun to read is opinion. That's your, the risk you're taking. That's what's exciting. It's like somebody's gonna go, gonna go for it. Like they're gonna either say this is great or this stinks, and they're gonna make an argument about why that is. And, and you're gonna be, that's gonna help you make your own argument. And you know, it's gonna help you see maybe something you didn't quite see before, or at least hadn't articulated. But, um, I don't know. But is this opinion <coughs> only subjective? And well, why I, would we, I mean, I, I'm saying this now a bit polemically, uh, if, uh, if it's just your subjective opinion, and not an attempt to, say, contextualize, to find out what's at stake at this work, and to judge it in relation to a specific historical constellation, you know, <coughs> if, if these aspects are not there, if it's just your subjective taste. Well, I think, I think that you only have your subjective response to go, to go on, mm -hmm. and that it's a very complicated one, and that most people don't know how to you're supposed to stop? No question. Okay. Uh, no, you, most, you, keep you keep talking. Most people, we are just starting, actually. The thing about getting about Question. Looking, question. <laughs> yeah. looking at experiencing a work of art is extremely complicated, mm -hmm. and and it's and I think it's essentially nonverbal, even even if it's Saul Lewitt, even if it's Lawrence Weiner, that basically what you're experiencing is something that's below language, mm -hmm. and that's make that's why at least in yeah particularly in America, that's why art has such a problem. Because I don't think we're, we're, no, we're not taught to look at art. We're taught to read, we're taught to read books. So that, you know, there's an immense effort that from kindergarten to the 12th grade, and we come out of that process and we can read anything. You know, we can read, if we want to read Dashiell Hammett, if we want to read Moby Dick, if we want to read Emily Dickinson. There's like, the whole thing is ready for us, but we're not, we're not at ease with looking, we're not at ease with sensuous experience, we're not at ease with understanding that your body really is this instrument of perception, and it's your whole body. And that the first step you take is just simply learning how to listen, but how to make yourself shut up and listen to your own responses. And then, if you're a critic, you then try to be as objective as you can about that. And that's where this kind of disinterest comes in. But I, I think, you know, I think that I, I have this privilege that I don't have to, I mean, I don't think I'm prone to big historical arguments. But I really think objectivity is a fiction. Yeah, and that's what um, I'm saying. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that you have this thing of your subjective experience and then you, you know, you try to back off from it. You try to say, well, am I thinking this because of that? Because it reminds me of an artist I admire or it reminds me of an artist I detest or it reminds me of something in my childhood. Or, you know, is this really there? Like, that's a constant question. So it's not only your voice, but many other voices as well, yeah. right? And it's, and, you know, I have a much more limited responsibility 
because I think that's what newspaper criticism is. It's, it's, this more, it's more ephemeral. Mm -hmm. And I think that one thing that we're not talking about that would be interesting to talk about and that's very important in terms of the internet is the role of editors. Mm -hmm. For example, I work for a place where they get, uh, they get really uncomfortable if you're just describing. Like that's, so you have good editors. That's, well, we have <laughs> editors. I mean, so much of the internet is yeah. not edited. And I don't exactly. see how you really can learn to write without unless, an editor. I, without agree an completely. Ed I agree completely. A, an editor, and B, an editor who checks every change with you. So that you're learning, you're in this process, you're really being taught. You know, you're just learning by experience. So I, I just think that that's why I say it. we don't know how this is going to develop. We're right at the beginning of this. And you have a few edit people that are editing things, but, but still, like, we have this thing hyperallergic that we have in New York. It's, it's much too personal. The interesting thing is, though, that the faculty of judging has become so widespread. Everybody judges. Like, if you only think of the like button at Facebook, it's a way of right. producing an aesthetic judgment. Right. So that's, in itself, an interesting phenomenon that judgment is not reserved to a privileged a group of people, but there is the, a kind of democratization of judgment. But I would agree with you, there's no reason to party about that, because uh, these texts in the internet, the blogs, are either very subjective kind of shit storms or overtly affirmative, uh, euphoric uh, uh, texts that, 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 that for me, um, yeah, what what is lacking is an editing process, and maybe a, right. uh, a coll I mean a collective editing process. I like to be read by several people even before sure. I publish, sure. because it, it, it's really helpful, you know. Because some things I, I just don't see. Or but I also understand. think you have to have more faith in the reader. So yeah. at a certain point, all the celebration or all the bile just becomes kind of boring. Yeah. So that so that that there's another kind of self editing, yeah. and there's a possibility for people to. Ask questions. Yes, sorry about this. <laughs> so we are done. <laughs> we are going. No, please, uh, I'm opening to the floor. And please ask questions as much as you can. There's one. There's a microphone. No? <coughs> no microphone? No microphone. What? This was so quick. Yeah. 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 You're right, it could have gone on. I thought we were just Thank you. Um, my, does this work? Uh, my question goes to Roberta Smith. Um, you, you pointed out two things at the beginning. Um, one was that you mentioned your readers don't have much time, uh, and then you likened criticism to the buying of work or to going to a gallery in that its essence is voting. Uh, and I thought that was very uh, interesting because um, in, a, in a way, I see voting as really like a, a kind of very much in the way you just talked about judging, like a, it's a kind of sovereign decision, but it's essentially mute. And in a way, it's the opposite or the end of a discourse. And um, I mean, it's a, it's a binary signal. It's not discourse, it's a binary signal like the like button on Facebook uh, or buying something at auction and it can be calculated and it can be statistically captured. Um, and. Of course, it makes me think of the prevalence of rankings these days or of social media. Um, and so if voting adequately describes the actual function of discourse and of criticism in the system, then I'm wondering what is the purpose of making an argument or, for example, the editorial process that you were just asking for? Um, that was sort of over my head. But anyway. It was pretty cool. Um, I think I have a, 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 a higher notion about voting than you do. You know, I don't, that, that I'm talking about, so that's, a, that's a kind of shorthand for me about how consensus is built. And I think that consensus is really all that is really happening and, there, and that we all participate in it. And um, I, I don't see it as this kind of cut and dry thing you know, like a yes or a no. I think it's much more complicated in the way it kind of works in with other votes, you could say. But I'm not interested in a real hierarchy. Do you know, I'm not really interested that, that the art critic is that much superior to the person who buys something at auction. I, I have a different material, I have a different medium, but I'm putting, I'm making a kind of statement. And we can talk about, you know, I'm, I'm sort of saying this in an idealist, way because I think that there 
plenty of art dealers who are passionate about what they do. I mean, art and art collectors as well, who are driven to, to do what they do and do it in a really interesting way. Like, I don't think it's just they're good guys and bad guys. But I don't think that I'm really getting at what you're trying to get at. Um, for Ms. Smith, I'm just curious, reflecting back on your career, uh, if you hadn't become an art critic, what do you think you would have wanted to do? <laughs> uh, which is another way of asking why, what drew you to criticism in the first place? What drew you to the medium of language when you had worked so much with artists and had engaged with them in a way that you had never engaged in academia? Um, I was sort of raised in a part of academia in the Midwest and I was kind of tired of it, and I had a really bad college career, so I wasn't about to get into any graduate school. And I loved the fact that the, uh, the great thing about being in the Whitney Independent Study Program was coming to New York and suddenly realizing that artists are actually in the minority, that the art world is made up mostly of people who are not artists, who have a kind of need to be around art and to kind of find something that they can do. And I ended up finding criticism. I started out in a museum, albeit just as a secretary, but I had enough experience in a museum to know that I didn't want to be in an institution, that I wanted to do something that I could kind of consider my work, even though it would be in this larger context of some kind of publication, even though it would also function quite frankly, as a kind of consumer report. Because I'm, you know, one of the things you do as a newspaper critic is to tell people, you're, you're advising people on how to spend their time and their money. And I don't mean collectors. I mean, is this art fair worth going to? Will you get anything out of it? Here's some of the things I got out of it. Or else, no, it's not worth going to. Is it worth your 10 or 20 or now, I guess, 40 bucks? Um, but I, I came, became a critic in a haphazard way, which is the way I think you, you did for a while. And now it's much more formal. But I had always written, and I'd always been, been really interested in art, and I had never had any, uh, not the slimmest I, you know, scrap of an idea that I was an artist. And at, at a certain point, it, and I think being around Judd was, in, was incredibly, you know, was just dumb luck, because he had been a really great critic. And even before I knew I wanted to be a critic, I, I was just telling Isabel about this. I actually retyped all of his early reviews just as a kind of, just to do something to, to sort of be in his orbit. And I asked him if he, wanted, if he wanted to see all his writing together. And so I took these five years of review, which were spread throughout five years of monthly magazines, and I retyped them into a, a, a manuscript that was, was 150 pages of single space typing. And by the time I came out of that, I, even, I still didn't know I wanted to be a critic, but I, was, I had sort of become a Jedi, you know, I had just, a, in this completely lazy, effortless way. You were crying. Yeah, and then, I, then you work, work away from that. That was my question. <laughs> uh, now, I, I want to hear more about these important epics in your life, really, what you did with Donald Judd, how it affected, less theoretically, how it affected your work, the time at the Village Voice, what that was like, the, were the deadlines just as strict as with the New York Times, did you, did you write longer pieces? And then, with reference to the first part of your discussion, I was surprised by the, you know, the dismissing the transience of, of this art criticism, because, you know, after all, you're writing for the New York Times, this is... Yeah, but how many, how many critics for the New York Times do you have collected works? Not that many. Right, but there's the, uh, an authority in what you're writing. Uh, certainly, uh, there's an authority when I read about the, the falling apart of the Israel-Palestinian talks, or I read about uh, the, you know, something in Crimea, then I, I expect there's a certain kind of high measure of authority, authoritativeness, that you expect in the New York Times. And I feel I get the same thing in the cultural section, or is it different? Well, whatever it is, you know, I don't we don't necessarily see it. At least I don't really think about it that much. I'm doing my work. I have deadlines. I have editors breathing down my neck. You know, I have this to look at and this to write about. And I think each, each critic in each discipline at the Times has, has a slightly different readership, has a slightly different kind of fluctuating influence or power. 
and you're sort of given this platform, and then you make of it what you can. Um, and of course, it's a huge help because it gives you this kind of visibility. But I still think there are, there are individual voices that have different kinds of effects within it. So it's voice. The voice, you know, I always compare the voice to being like in a guerrilla camp, and the, the Times is like an army, where you have like totally clear chains of command, and it's it's quite frightening in a way, because the kind of increase in power at different levels, and the effect that has on people, and the kind of psychological situation that creates is really bizarre. The thing about culture is that we stay where we are within it. We don't move. You know, critics, I don't, I'm not going to be sent to the whatever. Like reporters are like just sent out. So we stay there. It's very weird. The voice was much more chaotic and um, and and I don't really remember it anymore. <laughs> but it was thrilling when I was there and I and um, you know like I got fired from the voice because they didn't think I was really hip enough. And um, that was a revelation. It's you know, getting fired is really interesting. It's something interesting to endure. Um, but anything else? Um, Roberta Smith, you were talking about um, people having the need to be around art. Um, I haven't witnessed anything in the art world before the year 2000, maybe. Pardon? I maybe haven't witnessed anything in the art world before the year 2000. So I would like to ask you, um, um, why are there today so many people having that need to be around art? Um, so many young people like trading their possibility to do economic studies for doing art history, um, working in internships unpaid to collect symbolic capital. Is it to be witnessed in Exodus? out of the world of, of reason, of numbers, uh, into the art world? Is art maybe the new only currency that will prevail in the long term? And are people now betting on that? <laughs> the second question that I would like to ask you after that is, how did you feel about the performance art film of JC in Pace Gallery in last July? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'll answer the second question first, which is that I refuse to answer that question on the grounds that it was, that it was fine. You know, the art world is a crazy place right now. It has an unusually, it's unusually visible and kind of dominant and attractive. I think it's, I sometimes think there are a lot of people who shouldn't be in it, that art has become so diverse, the uh, porous and, and spread out and the idea that there are a lot of people saying, well, this is art, this is art. I mean, I have lots of issues with the whole concept of social practice. My feeling is stop practicing and get out there and change the world. Like, this is, if you really want to have an effect, have the nerve to deal with reality. I feel like there, there are a lot of, there are, you know, the, 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 the opposite side of, of the market, I think, is a lot of guilt among younger people who feel that they can't, they don't, you know, that they're supposed to do something that, that's going to improve the world, but also a lot of fear because it's actually easier to stay in the art world and, and do this rather than to actually get out there. But I think it's, I mean, I think, you know, I think there's a tremendous need for all kinds of culture. I think it's essential. I don't think that art that sits on its ass in a museum, as Oldenburg said, is not doing its job. I think it's doing something. And there are lots of other forms of art. So there's a need for it, and we're seeing that. But we're also seeing this kind of exaggeration, which has to do with money, which has to do with a kind of perceived glamour, and a kind of disaffection with what you say, other, other ways of, of working. But I always say to people, if you cannot be an artist, if there's any way you can avoid being an artist, avoid it. <laughs> because to do it really well is incredibly hard and to do it badly just kind of like creates more things you know <laughs> and, <laughs> and if you have to do it no matter what and you don't care what kind of what degree of success you have and you don't care how much you suffer then I understand that and I really admire it 
but there are, pl there are plenty of other ways to use this thing in you, you know. Being an artist is just the most kind of glamorous and hopefully remunerative one you can think of. I mean, I'm always interested in the idea that most, a lot of really good dealers are former artists. Yes? Uh, uh, the nature of the game has changed quite a lot. The was charging 25 bucks to find the most amount of an audience, and along with that comes a certain um, entrepreneurial and empresarial role as an artist, which um, I think trades on, I mean, most of the artists that have been mentioned here are close to dead, and except Jeff Koons, and some people wish he was. Um, so I, I just wonder how it, being analytical, it has changed over the course of this, 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 this attempt, and art fairs are part of it too. They, they, they try to spread themselves all over the cities. They try to have big public events. You know, ha, you know, some some large degree of art is now video with a disco component, and um, I I don't know. I mean, let's say you just liked it because it was entertaining. Is that enough? Look, it's a very big sphere, okay, and nobody is going to control it and everybody is part of it. You cannot stand in moral judgment and say you're superior and those guys are wrong. It's just, it, 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 we've, we've, everybody's been doing this for years. I mean, I'm not gonna, I, that's my opinion. I'm not gonna be able to stop it. I agree with you that museums are in a bad way. I think that curating, the, the profession of curating has become too academic and gotten too far away from art objects and kind of you know, I hate what's happened to the Museum of Modern Art. I feel like it's a huge tragedy for New York, and you know, Berlin will probably benefit from that. You know, that we basically a kind of something very important in the New York art world is dying. Basically, that's what's happening at the Modern right now. So I totally agree with that. But I just think that at any point in time, you're going to have something that that, that a lot of people think is wrong. If you go back to the '50s, you've got starving artists. You know, now, and that's, that was kind of one, one way for things to be out of whack. And now things are out of whack in another way. I think there are still a lot of starving artists. I think there are a lot of starving there are artists. Artists with like hundreds and thousands of dollars in debt, student debt, all over the place. And okay, so that's at a certain point, that's going to reach a kind of tipping point. You know, yeah, I think I, I th all of those things are bad. I, I don't encourage people to go to graduate school if they can help it. <laughs> Real, not artists. I mean, I, but I see why they want to, and if they think that the, the debt is worth it, it's fine. And yes, there are struggling artists, and that gives that's that's something that's actually. I'm glad to see that people are willing to take a risk on it. They're struggling art dealers who are who want to do what they want to do, and they'll open. What, in, in some kind of space, in some part of town. I mean, it's all, I don't know. I'm sure that, you know, I have a very distinct and biased point of view, but I do think that you just have to work at your work in a certain way. And if you can't, and you have to do as much of what you absolutely must do as you can. And I know that that will sound kind of naive and idealistic, but I don't think that if you really look at what you're doing, you would think you're doing much differently. You know, everybody's trying to do something. Yes? I have um, two things I was just thinking about while you were talking. Um, the first one is actually um, Rainer Maria Rilke and his letters to young poets, where he really talks about the fact that as an artist, basically, you have to stay away very far from criticism. And the way he puts it is that you can you can only be a real artist when you have gone so deep into yourself. And when the question that's asked, can you live without making art? You have to answer no, and then you make your art, and then you really don't care what anybody says about it anymore. So I think that was also something you referred to. And another thing, um, 
is just a little phrase. I'm working with Aurel Scheibler, and we have a wonderful Guston exhibition coming up for Gallery Weekend. And in reading about Guston and Morton Feldman, there is this great phrase of Morton Feldman, where he says, there was this very happy time for about six weeks in the 50s where nobody knew what was going on in the art world. <laughs> That's great. But I, I, I don't really, you know, there are all these great good old days that we can look back on. <laughs> but we're in, we're in this moment, and this is what we have to contend with. And, you know, you, want it, you might want it to be different, but there's actually, it's only going to come different out of the kind of individual desire sort of coalescing in certain directions and I'm not you know sure you you could say well artists should change it or it's not going to change until this happens or that happens it will change but you know it's still going to be kind of a lot out of individual desires about people doing things and saying okay yeah that's better than this and somebody will write have a kind of blog that has real criticism on it and that will have an effect it's like the situation's very, very open, and I'm just interested. I don't want to be feel like this. The idea that this is not as good a time as some other time, it just it seems like a waste of time, really. Mm -hmm. This is the time we've got. These are the things we have to deal with. Yeah, there are lots of things that I hate that are that make you distressed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, I think everybody has lots of made had lots of major complaints all along. You know, so this is we have a certain set of them now. You know, they are, okay. But if we are in the very literal time that's very open and logically, is there a, a sense or a kind of will, I guess, to, to shape or drive uh, where our might go? Um, if we're not talking about canons now, like we were in the good old days, is there still a sense that that's a possibility? Or can one, uh, an acoustic opera go I don't know. You know, Judd says criticism is after the fact. You know, and the next line was Frank Stella is one of the recent facts. It was like written in the early 60s. But um, I'm not that kind of a critic. I know I'm, I'm just the kind of nose to the ground. I'm interested in, in helping artists make better work by giving my response. I mean, that's kind of presumptuous. I'm interested in getting people to look at what I think is good and, and they'll get some benefit out of. And it's, I just see it as a very incremental process. And sure, there are things that, I, that start happening I, that I think are less interesting. Um, Anyway, I'm not, I don't think I'm very helpful in that score. Well, actually, I think you're very helpful, and I'm told I'm supposed to bring this to an end, this part of the evening to an end now, but of course you are prescriptive. You had that very, I thought, very forcefully argued piece on folk art, and, and you know, yeah, we, didn't, you know we, we didn't get there. Outside art. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's the other thing. When you talk about, about the size of the art world, we're actually talking about a very concentrated, rather small area in some ways. You know, art... There's so much art going on outside of the art world, uh, the, what we call the professional gallery art world. There's, there are outsider artists. There's, there's, it's, it's much bigger than that. I mean, I think that one of the greatest 20th century American artists is a quilt maker named Rosie Lee Tompkins. And I think she will eventually be recognized as such. But She's not in anybody's canon. Bare, people barely know about her. She's been in a, she was in a Whitney Biennial, thanks to Larry Rinder. I just think, you know, what we think of that's going on now is, is our own weird view. There's so much more. And, and, and what, what is going on now will constantly be revised. Each, each, as we go into the future, just like we think, we know now that there's, and I, again, I speak as an American, so I apologize. But we know now that there's so much more going on in the 50s than abstract expressionism. It's, a, it's, it's become a much bigger decade. You know, that was, just, that was just a sliver. That was just a certain way of being. And it affected other ways. But there are tons of other things. There's this weird guy named Steve Wheeler, you know, the music, Indian space painters. There's different kinds of women we don't know about. So I don't know. 
Sorry to end on such a kind of. <laughs> well, and that's what what makes your writing so rich, and 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 the the view of art that you've painted for us in these last decades. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Uh, to Berlin, thank you very much for moderation.